Okay, it's 12 o'clock. Time for our third lecture today, actually second in track B. Thank you for coming. Mr. Mark Baker, representing the diversities within the PHP community and the person behind PHP office. Please welcome Mr. Mark and his talk, Anonymous Classes Behind the Mask. Unos, dos, tres. Great. Ah. High five, peoples. Technology is wonderful. Okay. Anonymous classes, in the same way as we define anonymous functions, we define them in line within our own code. We don't use separate class files for them or anything like that. We define them as and when we need them. We define them in code. Occasionally, in some of the PHP uh, blog posts that you see people posting, they can be referred to as inner classes or nested classes. That's not quite true. An inner class or a nested class actually inherits the scope of the class where it's defined. PHP's anonymous classes don't. But we can cheat. I'll come to that later. We can make them true nested classes. The fact that they're defined dynamically within our code means that we don't assign them a class name. PHP gives them a secret name internally. So we're defining something, a class, without a name. How do we actually use it? We can't do new XYZ because we don't know what XYZ is in this case. There we are. That's how we define it. Very simple, very straightforward. And the oddity that you might notice there is I'm assigning it to a variable called object instance. What we actually get created isn't simply a class definition. We define the class, but we also instantiate it in that one step. So you can see from that, we don't have a name for the class. That's internally assigned. You do need to remember the trailing semicolon at the end of the definition. Hopefully your IDE will tell you if you've forgotten that. And we pass in a set of arguments to the definition, which are used by the constructor of our anonymous class 
which then returns the instance. The name that's assigned internally to that class is actually a reference to the point in PHP's internal memory where that class is defined. So it does have a name, but it's not a name you're going to use. It'll be something like anonymous at 1386A5B72. You're not going to use that in real life code. So it actually instantiates for you. That is actually quite significant, but again, something I'll come to later on. I'm not sure how easy it is to read the code at the back there, or even at the front. Code never comes out well on slides. But I will post this on SlideShare, so you will be able to read it at your leisure later. But there's an example of creating an anonymous class. I'm creating it within a function, but I'm passing in an array of arguments to be used when it's instantiated, I can then call the function multiple times and it will create instances of the same class because of the position in memory is the same. It's the position in memory within this function definition. This particular example is simply a formatter. It implements the two-string method so that I can echo the instance of that particular anonymous class and it will display something for me. In this case, as straightforward as that. I pass it a set of latitude, longitude values, and I use the echo to actually display the output. It's not something I particularly need. I can throw it away afterwards. It's just a glorified decorator. So when I run that, it echoes all those out, and very simple, very straightforward to use. Um, a bit overkill, not something you particularly need in this case, but simply as an example of how to create, instantiate, and how to call the methods in that class. It's useful to remember that when you create your class definition, you can use traits, you can extend existing classes, you can implement interfaces, create quite complex classes. So I had a bit of fun waiting in an airport one time, creating an anonymous class factory. Uh, where I can pass it a model name for it to extend, and I can pass it a series of trait values so that they will be implemented by the anonymous class, or it will create an anonymous class that has that, that implementation. So in this case, it will extend the user model, it will apply a soft deleting trait to it and an auditable trait to it, and create me a class instance or an instance of an object that fulfills all that. That is a basic set of the traits. It's a basic user model. I then use or create the anonymous class definition as a string, but because I'm creating a string, I have to use eval to actually do the instantiation. That creates a little problem. Remember I said it referenced the point in memory where the class was created. When you use eval, it creates a brand new block of memory. So every time I call this, it's a different class because it's a different point in memory for the eval to use. And I discovered very, very quickly that it et up all my memory if I created 10,000 instances of the class. So the factory cheats. It creates one instance and then clones that. Um, that 
ensures that only a single memory location exists for the definition, it's only actually evolved once, and then you can clone as many times thereafter as you, as you need to. And the factory that I created actually handles all that for me. I'm not going to go into all the code of that. It's way too much to put on a set of slides like this. But if anyone does want to read about it, I blogged. That's a var dump of the instance that's created when we do that. So you can see that it's applied the traits, it's set the pro which have their specific properties. And calling it like that, there's your blog references if you do want to go and read them later. And the links for those will be in the slides I post on SlideShare. Uh, there were a few interesting, I modified the technique several times before I finally settled on a cloning method. So there's a whole host of different tests described in the blog for different approaches to the problem before I came upon a final solution that I was happy with. The reason I had to use eval, because I'm working on a string. And the folks in room 11 on Stack Overflow, which includes a lot of PHP's internal core developers, confirmed that that was the only way to create an anonymous class from a string. Uh, if anyone doesn't visit uh, room 11 on Stack Overflow at all, where the cool uh, core developers hang out, it's well worth a visit every now and again because they talk about some wonderful things. So, when we have our user controller that accepts an argument of type hinted as user model, we can actually pass in our anonymous instance because it matches that signature, it extends from user model. And I can create any number of models I want with different traits, I can dynamically modify the tra traits as necessary and create all kinds of different extended models with different traits as and when I need them dynamically defined and use them as I need to. There are a few limitations though to anonymous classes. They're not a be all and end all. When I first started playing with them I thought, wow, they're wonderful, I can use them for everything. I don't have to define another class as long as I live. I can use anonymous classes for everything. Well, not quite. As I mentioned, there is that problem with creation of the anonymous class and instantiation in a single step, which means you have to ensure that they're not every instance isn't actually a different class in its own right. The factory was my solution to that. You can't serialize an anonymous class, which means you can't put it in session. It means you can't write a serialized version of it to file or anything like that. So you have to remember that. It's effectively defined as final because you can't extend an, on an anonymous class. You don't know what it's called. You shouldn't need to know what it's called. But it does mean that you can't do anything more to extend it for what the fact that you were working with an instance rather than a class definition anyway should highlight that. You're not creating doc blocks for it. Your IDE will not type in the methods that are available in it. So it's a bit more awkward to work with from that perspective. Um, and you might have heard about all the cool things that Opcache does to improve the performance of your code, stripping out redundant code, simplifying the code in various ways to make it run as efficiently as it can, that doesn't apply to anything created as an anonymous class. So if you're writing lousy code, normally PHP 7's op caching will actually improve the performance of your code by stripping out all the bad bits that are, aren't necessary. It won't do that if you write a ba bad code in an anonymous class. 
Okay, I said I was considering using them for everything. You shouldn't really. For the most part, you should stick with normal classes defined in normal files, but there are a few useful cases for actually using them. I've listed a few of them there. I've got examples of a couple of those. So I use them a lot for testing as an alternative to mocking classes using PHP units mocking or mockery or aspect mock because I can very quickly and easily define a class that extends what I want to test and just override a method or whatever is necessary. So I use them extensively for mocking, but as my first example, this is a one-off object. I wanted to know when an instance of a given class went out of scope. I wanted it to inform me. So I used anonymous classes to do that. I create an anonymous class which has or uses the magic delete method. The magic delete method simply executes a callback to do whatever I want, such as notifying me whenever it's deleted. And I have a character class. I hope someone recognizes the names because I don't actually watch this series Game of Thrones at all but I'm told that these are all characters that have died in it. Some of the characters that have died in it. I think most characters have died in it at least once. <laughs> I have read the books I hasten to add. I've just never seen the series. So we create an instance of each of these characters, just stick them in an array or a collection or whatever, and then to some of those, I really should modify this to actually pass the names in rather than simply the IDs within the array. Three of these, we will add my anonymous class and what we're doing is passing or we're creating the callback and then attaching that anonymous class as a property, a brand new property, against each of those characters. Well, against three out of the four. And then we're unsetting the first two, so they will go out of scope and the class will be deleted, and with it all the properties, which includes our anonymous class property. So when we actually execute it, as each character gets deleted or killed off, and then we've finished, except we haven't. The script continues executing, and then as it terminates, the last character that we've got it attached to goes out of scope as the script terminates, so we get all those messages displayed. Now, we could do one or two other things with that. Um, but it's just a simple way of demonstrating a throwaway use of an anonymous class. It's not being used for anything in particular. We don't need a fully defined class to work with it. It's just a one-off for each of those characters that we want to work with. So we can just create it as an anonymous class as and when we need it, attach it, and not care about what else it may or may not need to do. It's not defined in our files because it's not necessary to be defined as a class in its own right. Okay, for those that like mocking, anonymous classes provide a great way of mocking, much, much simpler than PHP unit. Um, there is a very good blog post that uh, Matt Brunt, one of the PHP uh, Midlands organizers, wrote about mocking 
cl uh, mocking classes and creating stubs using anonymous classes that's well worth a read. Again, the link's in the slide share. You can follow it up later. I've been experimenting with one or two more interesting techniques, shall we say. I mentioned inner classes. An inner class is an anonymous class that inherits the scope of a class. So if we have a defined class, we can inject an anonymous class into it and use that to capture the scope of the class that it's injected into or of the instance that it's injected into. This is an example of a library I created called Spymaster. Spymaster creates an anonymous class which it then inserts into an instance of a class we want to look at and it can capture the scope of that by reading all the property names, reading all the method names and it allows us to look at those properties, perhaps even change them. At least being able to look at private and protected properties so that when we test a method in the normal class, our spy master instance allows us to check the private properties and protected properties of that class to see if they've changed as well. This is a slightly more complex one because it collects a list of the private and protected methods of a class, of the instance that it's injected into. And we have an invoker. It creates an anonymous class with an invoker which allows us to actually execute any of those private or protected methods from outside of the instance. So private and protected no longer needs to mean private or protected. We can actually execute individual private methods as part of our tests if we want to. And so we can test each individual method within a class irrespective of its visibility. That's its use. It basically overrides the call, magic call method. We could get it to include calling just in case the class we're extending has a call method already, but it works slightly differently in that it's used reflection to pick up on that and get the list, and it then uses reflection to pass through. So we set our spa we create a class that we want to test. We call Spymaster, passing that in so it can create the anonymous version. And then we're just calling our spy. And we're using the same method names in our spy through the invoker as the private or protected method names in the class that we're working with. Again, when you're testing, that can be very, very useful, particularly for getting specific access at unit test level to complex methods that need testing in isolation. It's not something I would ever use in production code. It is a very dirty hack as regards that, and it does make production code very difficult to follow if we can do things that we're not supposed to do. Your production code should always follow the rules of visibility. But for test purposes, it's permitted to create little backdoors such as this. Okay, again, a couple of blog posts for people that do want to read more about this. I get the feeling I'm talking very quickly and going through a lot of this material. Um, but I'm not sure about the timing. But at 
At this point, I would say, does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry, I am a bit short with that, but do we have any questions from the audience here? Okay. Uh, what I have found with anonymous classes, when I'm working with them, is that they are so useful for testing I try using them for other things as well. I can create them as service interfaces, extending or implementing an interface definition, and use that as a one-off to stub all manner of things, such as the database or whatever that I'm working with. But you can use them in, for, in production for similar things. If you've got a, a one-off interface, that you need to implement, but it doesn't need to be used anywhere else in the code, you can use anonymous classes to create that definition. You can use the eval method to actually instantiate it as and when you need it, and that will give you something that can be inject dependency injected into wherever it's needed, so you can create new services on the fly, all manner of useful things like that, and just call them when you need them. Your main services will still be the same, but just as a one-off for whatever purposes, such as a mailer that sends to DevNull just for test purposes, um, when you're working with the code or if you want to suppress something, you can create extended classes that override the public methods just as one-offs to suppress them or to change their behavior dynamically. Um, okay, I'm sorry that felt a bit short, but unless anyone has any questions, I'm done. Oh, and we do have a question as well. Yes. I could do that. It is possible, yes. Um, that was one of the options I did look at when I was experimenting with it. Um, but I found that performance-wise, it was actually easier to build up a hash table of the individual classes that I had created and then clone from that reference it meant that I didn't have to constantly be checking with reflection every time I wanted to do so. But it was something I did a lot of experimentation on different approaches to how best to do it. And I based it purely on which of those multiple different approaches provided the best memory efficiencies and speed efficiencies for me. Memory-wise, using reflection would be fractionally faster, uh, fractionally better performance memory-wise, but building a hash table was better performance-wise, speed-wise. And I was working with a set of 10,000 instances that I was creating um, in iterable loops. So 
performance made much more of a difference when I was taking that approach. I've not looked at that yet, unfortunately. It is on my checklist of things to do, but uh, yeah. I hadn't seen it was production ready. I knew he was experimenting with it, so I'd put it on my uh, list of things to look at, but I'm sure your list is as long as mine. Uh, anyone else with any questions? Oh, another one over here. Yes, I would. It's not so much a problem with using anonymous classes in production. There's certainly some valid use cases for that. Um, I'm beginning to find I use them too often in production. It's more one or two of the dirty tricks when it comes to being, access, being able to access or execute the private and protected methods and properties, which is very useful in testing, but I don't think that should be done in production at all. Overriding visibility, whether using reflection or whether using my spies in a production environment, I think is breaking the covenant of visibility that's defined for the classes. Incidentally, there is a rather dirty trick that I also use, which allows you to um, extend a class that's defined as final. Now, again, that is not something I would ever use in production. It's de declared final for a reason. But for test purposes, it can actually be quite useful to do so. So again, using an anonymous class, and in this case, I intercept the composer autoloader, load the class definition into memory as a string, build a class that extends that as an anonymous class. So I've bypassed the autoloader completely. It's a dirty trick, it works very well, and it allows me to test something that's very difficult normally to test. But again, I would not use it in production code, only, in test, only for test purposes. Uh, because that class has been declared final for a reason. And overriding that, again, reflection does provide a mechanism for it. Again, I believe it intercepts the composer autoload to do so, or at least better reflection does the Rove better reflection library. Um, I believe Doctrine does something very similar as well. Um, it's not something I would normally look to do in production. If a library has declared that class final or that property is private, it should be respected at the very least and only overridden for the most extreme reasons or for testing. Yeah. Okay. If that's everyone, I will be around for the rest of the day so I can answer any other questions that you might come up with. Just seek me out wherever I am. And I think lunch is probably approaching ready now, so yes. one benefit of yes. my finishing early is you get to queue before the other room. No, no, it's okay, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to... If you have any questions and you don't want to ask it, you do not want to ask them here. Uh, 
uh, in public. You can do it in the uh, meantime. Lunch starts at uh, exactly one o'clock. So you have a break uh, until then. Enjoy the beer, enjoy the pool. Please visit our evaluation pools and take some time to give us your feedback. It means to us a lot. Thank you.